Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Don't Let Your Mobile Application Project Spin Out of Control conference call. As a reminder, today's presentation is being recorded. At this time, I'd like to turn the conference over to Ms. Jennifer Hoganson. Please go ahead, ma'am. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's web conference. The title of today's session is Don't Let Your Mobile Application Project Spin Out of Control. Before I turn the presentation over to our presenters, I'd like to briefly offer a few housekeeping items for your assistance. If you have any questions for our presenters, we encourage you to post your questions throughout the program by typing them into the Adobe Connect Q&A forum. If time does not allow for us to address your questions, we will follow up with you after the program. For audio assistance during the program, please press star zero. Foley will apply for one CLE credit after the program. To be eligible for CLE, you will need to log into both Adobe Connect session and the audio session with your first and last name and email address. Those seeking New York and New Jersey CLE credit are required to complete the attorney affirmation form that can be found in your registration confirmation email. Enter the five-digit five code that will be announced during the presentation and return the form to jhogason at foley.com immediately after the program. Please log into the program using your confirmation links provided to you. If you have any difficulty with the login, please work with the help support noted on the confirmation email message or contact my Foley colleague, Delia Dye, for assistance. Her email address is ddai at foley.com. And now I am pleased to turn the presentation over to our presenters, Michael R. Overly, partner at Foley and Lardner, and Aaron K. Tansliff, senior counselor at Foley and Lardner. Mike, please proceed. Jennifer, thank you. So this is Mike Overly speaking, and my colleague Aaron and I will be talking with you about the ins and outs of app development. Uh, Aaron and I have the good fortune to sort of represent uh, all sides in uh, deals of this kind, from companies seeking to develop an app to app developers, uh, to others involved in the app process, providers of e-wallets, uh, et cetera. So we've sort of seen all dimensions of this problem, and we're pleased to share with you our experiences. And we definitely want to allow time at the end of our discussion for questions. Please do not hesitate to ask them. If we don't have time to answer all of them, we'd be very pleased to follow up with you after the presentation. I think if there is one overarching concept that we'd, we'd like you to take away from this discussion, it is just how complicated an app development project can become. The complexity and duration of the process is frequently underestimated by businesses who want to quickly achieve an app presence. And in all honesty, uh, you know, we've worked with companies uh, from very small to very large multinationals looking to gain an app presence, and sometimes they are shocked at the level of complexity involved in getting live with an app on an app store. I'd like to begin with this, this sort of overview portion of the discussion with a couple of examples to highlight that. Aaron is also going to give some examples as he discusses some of the points in his part of the presentation. But as a first example, we were working with a consumer home product company that wanted to create an app for its customers for use in stores that, you know, if a customer might visit a Home Depot or a Walmart or other store, which offered this business's products, they'd be able to quickly use the app to scan a, a SKU or a UPC or a QR code, get further information about the, the product, as well as look at how it might, be, uh, might appear in their home, and to do some other things with it, look at color choices, et cetera. So the app development uh, for that particular project actually involved three different developers in three different countries. Many times, as we'll talk about later in this presentation, to get leading edge, to edge development, to get developers who are doing really interesting things, a lot of times that means working with companies that are quite small, and frequently that means working with companies that are not inside the United States. Um, in this particular project, again, we had three app developers 
we did not have a general contractor. None of them would take responsibility for the overall project. This is something that would distinguish it from, say, a standard traditional software development project. And it's a theme that we're going to touch on a number of times in this discussion. In addition to the components of the application being furnished by those three developers, there were also applications and libraries, including open source software, that were provided by other third parties. There was a virtual reality engine. There was a payment processing application. There were certain graphical user interface um, portions that were licensed from others. There were various open source libraries that made it easier to work with certain mobile operating systems. And finally, there were the SKU, UPC, and QR code readers. All of those things needed to be combined. Once all of that was done, the business, um, the, the client needed not only an EULA, an end user license agreement for those that would be using the application, they needed to update their privacy policy to reflect uh, changes um, relevant to the application. They also needed a separate agreement for some associated online services that would be accessed through the application. And then finally, they also needed to accept the various developer agreements associated with the relevant app stores and iOS or, or operating system providers. All told in that project, there were nearly two dozen contracts involved. Front to back, it took over six months to get from the right agreements in place, do the development, integrate the pieces, submit the app for approval to the various app stores, which can be an unpredictable process, and finally have the app available for use by end users. Originally, the business thought it would be a 30-day process. This is not unusual. And again, we're going to be giving other examples as we go through. One other brief example, just to give you an idea of the, the, the complexity, we had a company that wanted to do something very, very simple, something that's done almost every day in, in applications, which is to facilitate in-app purchases of certain products seems like something that should be relatively straightforward. The problem was that the guidelines in the particular app store weren't terribly clear. So one of the things the company did is they contacted the expert help personnel and the developer portion for this particular app store to talk about how the calculation was to be made, how revenue sharing was to be done. And remarkably, they got not one, not two, but three different answers, depending on the three different people that they talked to at the app store. After two months of trying, they could not get a single unified answer to how to do the revenue sharing, and they ultimately had to pick the least offensive of them and ran the risk of a potential future noncompliance. Again, not an unusual circumstance. Well, since we have limited time, I want to quickly review the agenda for our discussion, and then we can jump into the specifics. So first of all, big picture. In this portion, we're going to be talking about the current state of the market in app development, and we're also going to emphasize the difference between app development and traditional software development projects. And again, this is something that we'll come back to repeatedly. It is very difficult to treat an app development project as you would a sort of standard, traditional software development project, and we'll talk about that in more detail. We're also going to talk about the preliminary issue risk assessment phase of app development. And although we view this as critical, it is frequently a step that is skipped or neglected by businesses. It should not be overlooked. And we'll, we'll be talking about the object is to determine the criticality of the application to the business, type of data being placed at risk, required timing for rollout, and other relevant issues. Next, we'll talk about the application, um, the, the App Store T's and C's. Um, as mentioned, you'll need to identify what app stores are relevant to you, what operating systems are important to you, whether it's Windows, iOS, Android, BlackBerry, which is seeing a recent resurgence in just the past few weeks. Uh, time will tell as to whether or not that's going to continue. The problem with the App Store T's and C's, as we'll discuss, they're frequently moving targets. They're made available online. They can be changed at any time. If you want to continue participation, you must accept. And they're generally presented as completely non-negotiable. Uh, the next agenda item is application development. As I mentioned, you'll frequently have more than one developer because of the complexity of these projects. And a lot of times, these will be smaller entities. And they may be offshore. 
In some instances, we find the client having to take the time to educate the developer about why certain contractual protections are important and why others are not. Uh, even today, we have problems with some developers not fully appreciating the risk associated with potentially infecting a million-dollar application development project with viral open source software. And so it's a conversation we need to have. We'll, of course, talk about the need for third-party proprietary software. And what we're talking about there is licensing pre-made things, like a QR uh, code reader or something else for incorporation into the final application. Let me move on to the next slide. Of course, we'll talk about open source software. And in almost every case, it is unavoidable. Um, most instances, you will see open source present. There are lots of great tools out there to facilitate interaction with the various mobile operating systems. So open source uh, is here to stay when it comes to app development. We'll talk about application and user license agreements. And here we're not just concerned about protecting the client, making sure their IP is, of course, protected and that the client's uh, liability is limited. But there are various requirements from the um, app stores and the operating system providers that you're supposed to include in your agreements, and so those must be included. Uh, privacy policies may have to be updated, or it may be the first time that the business decides to adopt a privacy policy, which will be required. And then we'll talk about related agreements, and there are many of them in an app development uh, situation. Um, the business may want to partner with some social media providers. They may want to implement a rewards program for frequent purchasers or frequent visitors. There may be joint marketing and advertising made available through the application. So let's get to the meat of our conversation and begin with big picture. And Again, the, the, the appeal of applications um, in mobile technology is extremely broad. It can, you know, we've seen traditional brick and mortar companies that seem to have, you know, no real technological bent, nonetheless very interested in, in developing an application. And of course, uh, you know, small or even large high tech companies looking at developing and deploying applications. So it applies to almost every type of uh, business. And it's important also to consider that end users of these applications need not be consumers necessarily. In fact, in many instances, the, the end target might be the company's own personnel, the business's own personnel, or it may be their business partners. And so you know, frequently these are not consumer applications at all, but rather applications to facilitate orders between businesses or to facilitate communications with a mobile workforce. And they can be anything from a glorified catalog of products and services to uh, providing access to a company's back office systems, their customer relationship management systems, uh, to making mobile payments. So it's a great variety of uh, potential things that can be done with applications. The whole point, of course, is to leverage the popularity of smartphones and tablets so that uh, the company has a further presence to the end user. And again, that could be a consumer, could be a business partner, it could be their own personnel. Right now, across the various app stores, there are a million mobile apps available, and the exponential growth is, is expected to continue. Right now, just for mobile ads, in 2011, we saw $5.3 billion in spending. I do want to talk about, and I know I've mentioned this before, mobile app development versus traditional software development. And you know, I, I think that it is important to understand that in working with a lot of these developers, when you're looking for leading edge, when you're looking for people doing new and interesting thing with, things with applications, frequently you do not find that at the, the traditional large-scale software developers. You're looking for smaller entities that are focusing their efforts in this area. And that means sending one of these entities a 50-page form software development agreement may not be effective at all. In fact, in our experience, we've developed specific agreements just for mobile app developers that are friendlier, more understandable, um, focused on key issues, uh, for example, open source software, um, 
care in incorporating other third-party proprietary software, those sorts of things. And so another difference in mobile app versus traditional software development is, in most instances, traditional software development, you've got one developer who's sort of overall responsible, the general contractor for the project. Mobile application development, you might not have that. You may have to serve as a general contractor yourself in trying to make sure that all the pieces fit together. So I think the thing to look at is what is realistic in this marketplace? How can we get to uh, an agreement with the developer rather quickly? In doing that, businesses must revisit their form agreements to make them more friendly to the mobile app development process. And this ties right in with the next point, which is time to market is key. If it takes six months to negotiate a software development agreement, that's going to be a business disaster in many instances. It's also important to take into account the process um, for submissions at various app stores and the time to receive approval for an app that is frequently unpredictable. Uh, although most of the app stores, including Apple, are trying to cut down on that timing, nonetheless, it, it cannot be well estimated. There's the need to differentiate your app in the marketplace. As I mentioned, there is an explosion of apps, a million of them, plus at this point, how do we make your app uh, more interesting, um, easier to identify than others? And that ties uh, finally to the value proposition. How do we justify the investment in developing the app? What is the cost benefit? Again, an issue to be discussed at the, within your business to ensure that there's a, a business case for making this investment of both time and money. And this actually ties in with our next slide, which is conducting the preliminary risk assessment. And what we're talking about is the sort of look before you leap. Uh, in the process, to take the time to gather the relevant stakeholders at the company to figure out what are we trying to achieve with this app, what do we need to do to get front to back from concept to an application actually being available on the app store. And all of this begins with identifying, well, who is the audience for the application? And do we anticipate any future expansion of that um, audience? Is it going to start, for example, with just our employees, and then we're going to roll it out to our business partners? Are we going to start with an audience which is just our end user customers, which are consumers, but potentially we want to extend that at some point to business partners, and does that make sense? Should there be two different applications? How critical is the application to the business? Is this going to become the primary means of contact between the business and its end users, its customers? If so, obviously very critical. Or is it more of a nice to have where it provides additional information about company products and services, but by no means is absolutely critical to the operation of the business? Are there online services that will be associated with the application? In other words, is the application, if you will, a gateway to services which are hosted by the company. And this could be a variety of things, from uh, communication services to um, purchasing. It connects the, um, the, the application to online databases or back office systems, payment processing, et cetera, um, at the business. Will there be additional terms and conditions associated with those online services? Will those online services be accessible through multiple means, say through the application as well as through a web presence? Is this relevant to the particular development? Next, looking at the types of data that will be relevant and collected. Are we getting transaction data between businesses for future analysis? Or are we getting personally identifiable information of consumers, which may be subject to state and federal regulation? and depending on where the application is used, even international limitations. Um, what kind of information will be collected about the consumer? Um, will we be collecting geolocation data? Will we need to put the, the, the end user on notice of what we're uh, collecting? Of course, will this require a potential modification to our privacy policy? Potentially, we need to have this thought out before the process gets too far down the road which is why the types of data absolutely critical to um, you know, understanding before the development process moves forward. 
And Aaron, I think you were going to talk about the regulated industry and potential patent issues. Absolutely. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, Michael. So the first thing to think about is that many of the regulated industries, such as healthcare, financial services, banking, insurance, and many others, uh, have regulations that are in place to ensure the protection and security of one's personal information. Uh, and, and generally, the risk, um, absent some type of contractual obligation, is going to lie with the distributor. And an example of this came up recently in a matter where one of these application developers that we were contracting with turned out to be a bunch of 16- and 17-year-olds. Now, asking them to understand and to ensure that they have complied with all of the various regulations for a financial service provider uh, it didn't really go over very well and, quite frankly, didn't really mean much, and there was no sort of uh, value to that. So it was important that the client put together those things that were important to it, explain how they needed to be implemented, and to ensure they were actually in the product and have the product tested. Uh, because traditionally, with most of their other software development, they can put terms in a contract that will say, you, you know, you, you comply with certain regulations, whether it's FINRA, PCI, uh, PCI, or whatever else it may be, or in the healthcare industry, the same type of thing. But if your people don't understand or, um, those implications or those regulations, it's really not going to be a valuable agreement. And so uh, another example uh, related to that is the FDA in 2011 had issued some draft guidance on regulations of mobile applications, but it's been silent since then. And certainly a lot of the developers and the companies are concerned or are thinking about what are we going to do. And in a lot of cases, there are companies who are sometimes waiting or there's been some stagnant in, uh, stagnation in the development of mobile applications for the healthcare industry. Uh, right now, the FDA has only reviewed about 100 apps uh, so far, and they estimate there's about 40,000 of them that are currently uh, in the marketplace. And there's questions about what does the FDA intend to review. So for example, they believe, many people believe they have no interest in regulating apps such as pedometers, uh, refill prescription apps, uh, medical reference, uh, even electronic health record applications. Um, but they really are looking at those things that are going to um, really compromise patient safety. And there's a question as to what that means. So there's a bunch of companies who are not submitting apps that maybe should have and others that are that maybe shouldn't have. And right now, the FDA is only getting about 20 applications a year. And I think they've reviewed about 67 or so today. Or sorry, it's about 67 or so days right now for the FDA to complete its review. So think about that. Uh, we had a, a healthcare provider who was submitting an application. And like Mike, they had thought this would have been maybe a 30 to 60 day process process, submitted their application to the FDA, and waited about um, just over two months for that review to come through. So bear in mind, any type of regulatory oversight is going to have uh, implications and possibly delaying your timeline. Uh, of course, the FDA is uh, expected to be delivering new guidance um, on or before October 1st of this year. Uh, the FTC has also issued a report regarding mobile privacy disclosures, uh, and it's called Building Trust Through Transparency. And it's really advice on keeping consumers' data information, sort of their, their information private. Um, they talk about privacy policies and what you need to do uh, to making them accessible and readable and understandable. We talk about how you share and how you how you should request permission and consent from a user before you share and collect their information, and certainly better coordination with third-party networks and, and advertisers and other uh, services incorporated into the application, uh, certainly due to sharing of data and information. And, there's a, and they also recommend there's a number of self-regulatory um, associations that are out there that people may want to join or consider um, viewing their rules and regulations. So another, uh, and then let me talk about patent issues and give you another example as well. So there's a number of applications out there that people will employ technologies either that they'll um, re uh, reference or they will associate with a second or or use services from a third party, or they may view something uh, that they would like to incorporate in their app and don't think about whether or not that's protected or not. So we had a client who it turns out uh, Look, there was a neat technology that they wanted to incorporate into their product. They thought it would make their product cutting edge. Somebody else had a technology in another version of an app in a sort of unrelated industry, but thought they would um, incorporate that into their product. It turns out that not only was that product under patent, it was actually by a company they were uh, actually already involved in a patent litigation with. So as soon as the app uh, went out to market, uh, they immediately got hit uh, by a lawsuit from the other company and sort of they added claims to the, exi uh, to the existing lawsuit. So it certainly put a, a 
um, certainly slowed down their mobile app development. And a lot of times this happens that, that because of the nature of mobile app development, people don't spend a lot of time thinking about whether things are protectable or protected by another part and they incorporate or they just link to and utilize those third-party services. So the application stores, um, there, there's a couple things to know about here. The first of all is that, all, is that certainly Apple and some other stores as well do have a um, review period that they have the right to review and reject possibly your application. Certainly Apple is, uh, there are rules that everything, everything that goes through Apple is reviewed. Google has its own sort of terms. It's not reviewed at the same level. And there's a number of location, uh, ways as well to put your applications out on the market without having them uh, reviewed at all, which does create some concern about certainly what your application is going to do. But the other, well, some of the other problems is that each of these stores have different requirements, partly because different platforms, different rules of how the stores work, different markets, but they all have agreements, first of all. And some of those agreements can vary quite a bit. As Mike had already explained, some of these things can be quite long. Uh, they can be sometimes a little difficult to, to uh, go through, and they can be difficult to find in terms of what is applicable and what's not. But also, as Mike indicated, they are generally non-negotiable. In fact, they're, you can pretty much assure that they are non-negotiable, and you have to take a look and determine whether or not you can uh, live with those terms. Now, some of the things that we hear from clients are, you know, since, there's, since I can't negotiate it with it and everybody else has already has mobile apps in there in their space, do I really need to review it? Or, you know, can you tell me if there's anything I really need to know? What, what are those two or three or five things that I should know about? And oftentimes, you know, that becomes a risk in itself because you find yourself in violation of those agreements. You know, one of the other things is that anytime you're building a mobile app and you're putting it onto a device, such as, for example, an Apple product, uh, you're going to be subject to the iOS developer program license, and sometimes, depending on the nature of your app, even things like the Mac developer program license agreement. And these have a number of terms in there dealing with, uh, that govern the operation of a product, the marketing of an app, what you may include, what you may not. They even have obligations regarding, uh, regarding the content you can put in the app, uh, privacy and ongoing support your uh, in terms of those requirements. Uh, that can vary by state, could vary by country, can vary by various other jurisdictions. So you need to give a certainly careful consideration to those terms and conditions to ensure that your app, that not only you comply, but your app also complies, because failure to do so could result certainly in your app being removed from the uh, platform operator. Then there's also the idea of you put, you know, when you tie in to uh, certain other app uh, providers or platforms, and certainly on the Google side or the Android side, that you can tie your product to platforms such as Facebook or Twitter or Google Maps. And then you start to expose you know, your app, you would say, to the success or failure of those platforms. But part of the problem is when you tie your product to a third party, that that could violate the terms of the developer or the application store. But also you have to realize, and it happens on a regular basis, that sometimes those other platforms decide they're going to change their terms, just like um, Apple or, or Google Play or Amazon could change those terms as well and on, uh, upon notice to you or upon notice up on the website. And as a result, they can block your access to their APIs or modify their terms of use. And therefore, your app, which once may have worked, may not work anymore. And there are future changes that, that, that the App Store itself or these other third-party apps could affect the um, could affect how your application itself works. So it's important to understand both the app store that you're in as well as those other products that we're, whether you're displaying your app or you're using major services such as, again, Facebook and Twitter uh, in your applications and make sure that those, uh, that if those applications are shut down or they turn off your feed, that you're still able to um, access those facilities or still able to use your application. And we talk about fee splitting. Uh, ge there's a general rule that uh, you know, certainly in Apple and Google, or in Google Play, that it's a 70-30 split. You can talk about you know how that gets done, but there's a several different models of how you would put your applications in the store. So I'll give you the example through Apple, and it's similar through others as well. There's you can put yourself in the general application store, the general app store. You can price anywhere from free to up to a thousand dollars. You split the 70-30. Um, you also, but you can you can restrict by country or region where you app can be sold or downloaded, but you cannot restrict who may download it. This is, again, in the general app store. There's all, there are optional educational discounts, um, and updates are required to be free and distributed through the app store.
Now there's also a business to business program which is separate from the general population app store which if you're creating applications directly for or a specific business, you can put them up in the store. And these are applications that generally are not meant to be for the general public and certainly ones that may be customized as well for a particular business. Again, same 70-30 fee split. Uh, there's optional programs for volume discounts and things like that. There's also an enterprise developer program. A lot of clients ask about putting um, creating uh, applications developed internally for in, in, internal use only, and that's where you would put them up. There's ways to do that. Obviously, uh, there's no uh, you cannot sell those applications out. So if you're building an application internally uh, and you want to put it in here, it's also you know it's one that you can't sell to a third party, um, and it's used by many Fortune 500 companies. And we've talked to them about how do they create apps and and put them uh, make them available to their employees internally. And there is a cost to that program and some other things. There's also subscriptions, and there's two ways of doing subscriptions. Everyone's heard about. Uh, and people talk about it all the time. I've created a program. I have a subscription for it. Why do I need to split my, mo you know, split the money 70-30 with Apple or, or, or with Google or whoever else? And that's there are ways around it. Certainly, there are differences between whether your application actually promotes the subscription internally or the subscription is completely unrelated to the application. There are um, you may not be required to share your revenue with Apple. And there's also things such as jailbreaks and you know other ways of distribution, which we'll talk about in a little bit later. And and certainly Google Play offers similar terms to a lot of these, but realize that when you get to the Android side of the house that most applications are actually distributed outside of Google Play in the Amazon app market. So uh, bear in mind that when uh, deciding on the platform that you're going to use. Um, I'm going to pause here for just a moment, and because for those of you who are seeking CLE in New York or New Jersey, the five-digit code that you need is Y B H. B, Y, again the code for those seeking CLE in New York or New Jersey is Y, B, H, B, Y. So this takes us to application development and sort of what are the differences with traditional development. And Mike has already given us a few things, so I'll add a few to that as well. So the first thing is that when developing applications for a mobile product, it's important to realize that a lot of mobile products um, have differences just because of the, the nature of the device. So one of them is they have less power, smaller processors, uh, little memory, uh, files can be slow to transfer, uh, connections may be slower than on an actual computer or on a network. You have to give considerations for data allowances. You may not be able to build applications that require an open, an always open stream. There may be limitations on streaming. And then there's also, you have to think about uh, those things that are usually more proprietary as well on a device, as well as the different ways that you will input data or the device will connect. Think about things like gyroscope features, the cameras. Also, you know, mobile devices generally have touch screens. And you have to think about how users input data into a mobile device, which is going to be different from your computer, such as voice commands, swiping, tapping, again, the gyroscopic movement, and, and, and there's other things as well taking pictures. So again, these are all things that one has to think about. And sometimes developers come up with new ways to input information, which may require a learning curve. And sometimes those may be suggested or, or thought uh, may not be the best idea when developing mobile applications. But then there's also built, building mobile applications for the enterprise environment, which has its own issues as well, in addition to just generic issues of mobile applications. And it's generally a little bit more challenging because you have to integrate those applications with the existing enterprise uh, systems and the databases, legacy applications, other web services, and other software products that you may have. And so generally, it's not so much an issue of tweaking a product, but there's certainly um, other things to be aware of. And again, as I said before, screen size and everything else becomes an issue when people who are used to using certain products in the enterprise move it to, an, uh, to a mobile device and want to be able to get the same full functionality. So it's important to think about that when building those uh, mobile applications. And certainly, you have to think about which uh, which platform you're going to build, and that's going to be, are you going to build it on an iOS, Android, uh, Windows, Blackberry? Um, are you going to build it in a native uh, environment? Are you going to build it in a hybrid or, or a browser environment? And certainly those things um, give a lot of rise to questions when thinking about how you're going to build a mobile app. 
But because of the mobile, the, the constraints on the hardware, certainly with mobile applications, a lot of mobile applications are taking advantage of cloud resources. And a lot of them, because they're somewhat, they can be more beneficial. However, doing so creates some potential concern regarding application security and application testing. And mobile applications become a little bit more difficult to test. And certainly, ones that will use cloud technologies will be even more difficult to test and secure. Uh, that's not to say the least they can't be done. So, you know, one of the you know examples, um, uh, Barclays Bank had invested and built out a private cloud, and in order to meet their mobile application demand. But you know, they're not the only ones doing it, and there's actually a business that is forming that has actually been around for a little bit now, called Backend as a Service, and these are basically cloud infrastructure services that are specifically designed to support mobile applications. And we've had clients discussing this. If you think about it, it, it is sort of the back end of your mobile app. It's a, a little bit unique. It's another cloud service. It has a few other, you know, has a new initial to it. But at the end of the day, um, these are services popping up to really uh, help build mobile applications. And certainly one of the other problems that's sort of moving this along pretty fast is certainly the consumerization of uh, information technology and bring your own device movement, something that Mike and I have talked about quite extensively as well. But that's also the, the, more, uh, the more liberal a BYOD policy, the more you have to think about your building mobile applications in the broad sort of spectrum of what you need to address. So when you talk about, again, mobile applications, you have to think about whether you're going to build it internally or externally. And certainly, there's a cost difference of doing so. And it may be simple to say, if you have a small application, games or, or simple functionalities, you may offload it, make a quick hit, sort of to say the least. But certainly, things that require more sensitivity, more protection, and certainly things that may be behind your firewall, you may want to give second consideration to, or separate consideration as to building it internally or not. Um, again, you know, and all these things sort of rely upon, and we'll get to this, I, I see a question certainly relating to this topic, and we'll get to this a little bit more in detail, but this all relates to, again, what platform you're going to build on, uh, whether you're building as a native approach on the device's uh, operating system, whether you're building a web-based approach, or you're going to build sort of a hybrid. And we see a lot more uh, companies who are building sort of a hybrid approach, which is, you know, balancing between the, between the web-based and the um, uh, application-based. So, <clears throat> sorry. So one of the other one of the other problems is that in terms of with application develop, and Mike discussed this as well, that a lot of times it's by multiple developers who are developing this, and sometimes it's certainly offshore. And a lot of times it becomes difficult. You have to worry about moving data, and we can talk about that a little bit more. But moving data and information. Um, and whether you can do that, uh, whether or not you can enforce contractual terms against those people who are overseas, whether or not, you know, what happens if something goes awry in your mobile application. And so the, <clears throat> sorry, so one of the other things certainly that we've seen come up in mobile applications is security. We could uh, talk about that a little bit more. In a lot of cases, this becomes something that's sort of due to the shortened life, or life cycle of mobile application development. In some cases, some things get forgotten about. Um, there's, certainly there's certainly mobile uh, or security threats that happen server side, some client side. We had a client who was doing certain testing of their mobile application and wanted to get things done a little bit faster, so they had disabled their security certificate verification in the process and never re-enabled it when it, went in, when it went live and went uh, into distribution. Uh, there was another client who, had, you know, who didn't secure the code and ended up having some client-side code injection into it and caused uh, the code to become malicious. Um, there's also an issue of, you know, traditionally there's an authentication and authorization uh, procedures which are separate, but on many mobile applications they're seeking to rely upon a single identifier, and you have to give consideration as to how that may affect uh, your application. And a lot of times applications seek to share information with the device itself or with other applications, and that, itself, that could expose additional vulnerabilities into the mobile application. And there's also, we've heard some stories about data leakage that have come by uh, the device itself or the application logging or storing or caching certain information and that information being hacked into by uh, third parties. So moving on a little bit. So third party proprietary software. So what you need to do is identify certainly early on as to you know, what applications or what products you may want to use or services. And Mike uh, certainly talked about that as well with his example and, and another example. Um, 
that we have, I have a, pro, uh, a client who's going through, I think we're now about on month nine or 10 uh, from when we started the process. We are still nowhere near uh, completion. Uh, they had an idea of what they wanted the application to do. And over time, uh, they thought all this stuff could be either done internally or they were able to just offload it to other third parties. And it turned out that a number of these third parties said, no, you can't use our services unless you have a license from us, unless you certainly pay certain fees. Um, and so there were a number of uh, products that we had to you know, go back through and determine whether or not we can still use these, how we get around them, do we need to take a license out, do we need to recode. And some of these third parties require the code to, have, you know, to, to only make calls in certain ways that required redevelopment. And, and it's certainly all of these third parties, as I mentioned earlier, certainly with like the Facebook and Twitter example, you have to understand their terms and the fact that they as well as, as, well as the platform can change the terms um, at will and upon sort of notice or posting. And they can also reject or they can turn off their service potentially and that could affect the value of your application or the functionality of your application. Um, applications are certainly generally defined by copyright law and ownership is defined sort of by the author, but certainly what happens if you outsource the development of the application? Uh, what happens you know, if there's jointly owned the app? You, uh, what happens if your application is derived from open source? And we'll talk about that in a moment as well. Um, and then you have to determine whether or not your application would be distributable to third parties in terms of the code, whether, it's, whether you need to hold on to that code as proprietary or, or it's fine that the code be, you know, the source code be distributed to other people as well. Uh, you want to make sure that certainly when you deal with third parties, uh, that becomes clear. Certainly there may be things being developed and as well uh, between you and a third party licensee or a licensor or your, your application developer. And you want to make sure that those agreements uh, state that the application or the ownership of the app is a, is a work for hire. You also want to think about whether or not you need to have a non-disclosure agreement and certainly those are um, very important. You don't want information that you're disclosing to an application provider to be used for other applications. And uh, however, a lot of these application developers will say that, you know, they you know they churn these things out um, all the time, and so they use something from one application to another. So you need to give uh, certainly thought about that. Uh, and you also have to think about when you talk about like in third parties whether or not your application is going to be using certain copyrighted content such as images or videos or sound recordings of others. Do you need to procure um, rights clearance from the third parties from copyright owners? Uh, certainly, do you, you want to be protected from infringement claims? You want to make sure that you have clearance before you use any third party uh, software or any other third party uh, content. There's certainly possible trademark concerns. You know, what if your app uses features or, uh, or content that's similar to some other registered product or trademark? Uh, the app could infringe, you know, for example, a name. We had recently someone was using a name or an image on their, uh, on their app logo, which was uh, unfortunately confusingly similar to that of a large uh, company that was not willing to or was not pleased that somebody was potentially infringing uh, their trademarks. And you want to make sure that the developer will identify any use of third-party trademarks, patents, copyrights, whatever it may be, and certainly any third-party uh, proprietary software that's used in there, you need to make sure that you're aware of those terms, uh, whether or not there's any fees associated with that. And you also want to think about potential uh, uh, liability from users who may post infringing content as well. There we can talk, there's the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which may help avoid uh, certain liability from those who are uh, posting content that, sh that shouldn't be posting. And you want to make sure, though, that you're, that you're aware of those terms in there, such as being uh, you need to immediately remove the infringing material when a complaint is received, disable repeat infringers, uh, don't receive any direct financial benefit from the infringing activity, and sort of adopting reasonable technical measures to avoid infringement. So open source for a moment. So open source is currently used in about 88% of Android phones and about 41% of the iOS-based phones. And it requires some special consideration because the open source licenses, such as some of the more famous ones, such as GPL, LGPL, or Apache, have specific requirements for attribution, distribution, uh, non-discrimination with respect to the platform. Um, so the first thing you have to, again, give consideration as to whether or not you want to or will allow your code for your mobile application to be distributable to third parties. And certainly, you know, if there's open source in there, and depending on the nature of the open source, you may not have a choice. 
But a lot of times, it turns out that developers, and certainly when you use multiple developers, you find out that there's multiple open source licenses that are governing an application. Well, what happens at that point? Sometimes it turns out they're compatible, and sometimes it turns out they may not be compatible. So, you, so it's very important to identify the different components of the application software, the various open source licenses that it's based upon, and sort of the require, compliance requirements for each one. It's also important that when you draft terms of use that, that, it that it complies with all the required open source license considerations and requirements. And you want to identify those components uh, you know, of the application software over which the developer can, ex can um, exhibit or exert an exclusive intellectual property right over. So you may need, there may be ways, depending on the nature of how the software is developed, that certain aspects of the software may be distributable. Other aspects you may be able to keep as proprietary, and you need to identify those aspects which are open source, those aspects which may be proprietary. And you also certainly may need to make sure, depending on the open source license, that any code that you have in there, uh, that you distribute that code. It's also important to know that when you use open source software, unlike some other third-party software, that you may not get any um, warranties or support. Uh, from those, from the device. So if there's a problem, a lot of times with software where there's a, an error found or there's some type of vulnerability found, someone will issue a patch. It's not going to happen generally with open source software. And if it turns out that somebody is infringing or that some open source or product distributed under an open source license has an, an, uh, an infringement or uh, um, activity in it associated with it, if it infringes on a third party, you will not be indemnified for it. So you can't look back to your licensee or licensor in that case. And again, all pretty much all open source license or software is distributed on an as-is, where-is basis. So if it doesn't work, you're, you're kind of out of luck. So talking about EULAs, or the end user license agreements for the applications, Again, you want to identify the relevant app stores that you're going to be distributing, and there's a number of stores that you can distribute applications in. It's important to understand that each of these stores may have uh, differences and may have, um, uh, may have different terms and requirements on how you structure your EULA as well as uh, the terms and conditions for your uh, end users. You don't want to generally rely on the end user license agreement that's provided for the app stores, certainly these are very favorable to the um, app store uh, distributor. If you think about, or the, for the app store itself, you know, if you read through many of these terms, most of uh, these terms are all about disclaiming any liability or responsibility to the app store as opposed to the actual um, uh, licensor of the application. And a lot of times they don't provide adequate protection, whether it's regulatory protection needed or indemnification or distribution um, or restriction requirements on the application that's being distributed. But you, and you want to ensure that any required App Store terms are included. Many of the App Stores, and Apple as well, does put out uh, guidance or information on what must be included in your end user license agreement that if you're not going to use their default and what those terms are. And you want to make sure they're in there because your app could be rejected uh, from the store based upon not including those terms. You want to strictly limit your liability and disclaim warranties. These, many of these applications are being distributed for free. Many of them are being distributed for low cost. There always, always are exceptions. There's applications out there certainly that are retailing for a uh, for thousand dollars, and certainly well up there near that number as well. Uh, but that being said, most of the applications you want to uh, again your your end your end user license agreement. Make sure the customer or the uh, end user knows that there is you know, their limitation of liability or, or what they expect if there are damages um, are very few and far between and that any warranties are, are being disclaimed. Again, most applications are going to be distributed sort of as is, as available. And then you also want to think about, again, we talked about are there other online services or other third-party services that are going to be available. And you need to make sure that you link those terms to your application, to your EULA. You have to make sure that people are aware of them, but you also want to make sure that you are not claiming liability for something uh, being provided by a third party. And certainly the same thing with privacy policy, as Mike uh, had alluded to. You know, a lot of these applications, based upon the nature and the way they use and collect your data and share your data with others, a lot of times the standard privacy policy that you may have in your store or on your website uh, may not be appropriate for a mobile application. You, know, you need to give uh, significant consideration as to how you are going to uh, store, collect, use, and transmit, and share uh, data. Now, 
a lot of this, though, throughout the presentation and certainly on this slide, is really referencing sort of U.S. law. And we have, uh, you have to be aware that you may need to consult uh, uh, consult and comply with laws in many other countries as well as where the app is being distributed. You have to think about various consumer protection and privacy and data protection laws as they vary between the U.S. and Europe and China and India and other nations uh, have also been developing heightened restrictions on uh, use of this information and activity. If an app is being distributed in a country uh, you know, outside of the U.S., it's certainly highly advisable to consult with an attorney who is well-versed in, uh, in local laws dealing with privacy and consumer laws in those, in, in those locations. But it's also to ensure that your application developer, as well as the application itself, does comply with all of the laws in those countries being marketed and distributed in. There's a number of applications that do cross border. And due to the nature of the applications crossing border, it means that you may need to comply with more than one set of laws. You may need to think about whether your application infringes the intellectual property laws not in one country, but in multiple countries. And you have to think about where those applications can be downloaded and where they can be used. Uh, certainly, for example, the laws in England, for example, may differ from those in mainland Europe and in the U.S., and certainly some have tighter restrictions on the use of information and intellectual property. One of the things to think about, though, one of these things, as I said, you can restrict your applications, certainly under many of the stores, under um, Apple, under Google Play, under Amazon, on a country-by-country -country basis. But be aware, certainly on the Android side of the house, that most applications are being downloaded outside of those stores. So you have to give a lot of careful consideration where there isn't a restriction on how those applications can be downloaded and where they can be downloaded. We have a client that was a global, uh, um, a global company providing certain types of uh, disasters related services, and they had their application being delivered. They actually had two versions of an application, those internally and those externally, um, and certainly their application they had intended. They had built a one version of the application intended to distribute on a global basis, and we took a look at what they were doing with the application, and it required certainly a pulling back of the application, looking at what they were doing, because certain laws didn't allow them to do certain things or required different types of disclosures, uh, depending on which country they were in. So it, re it required um, sort of an extensive review and re uh, of, that, uh, of those sort of terms. Uh, privacy policy sort of touched on that a little bit. I want to make sure we get through the rest of this deck before time is allotted. But uh, certainly with the privacy policy, you think about, again, what your application is doing. But in most cases, your application is going to touch upon some type of user's uh, information, their personal information, whether it's geolocation, use of the app, uh, personal identifiable information. And you have to think about the collection, the storage, the use, the transfer, the sharing of that information. And all those things go into consideration as how you develop a privacy policy policy and what disclosures you're going to need uh, from that. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, you can certainly see in the news lately there has been a number of lawsuits against Apple and others for breach of privacy and data storage, and certainly these things are becoming more and more of a real concern for both end users and companies alike. You know, in one case that Apple had, they had a problem that they were the storing of the location of the data of the end users. It was an unencrypted format. Uh, it was being used for certain commercial purposes. And while you know a lot of these cases, when we talk about these types of damages, we can talk about there is an actual harm committed or a potential harm or damage committed, but there's no uh, monetary damages are still being difficult are still difficult to assess in a lot of these cases. But certainly, any type of privacy concern, whether whosever application is, can negatively impact uh, both an end user's opinion of an app and certainly the marketing and sale of an app, or even the use thereof. And so a lot of times you can deal with these privacy and data protections by drafting effective terms and use and privacy policy statements that are reflective upon the, the consumer base and the privacy practices of the company. But at a minimum, any of these things should include what information is being collected, how it's being stored, how it's used by the developer, how the information is shared with third parties, how can the user opt out of providing such information? How can they review their information and, uh, and change it if they believe it's inaccurate? And certainly, who do they contact for any types of complaints related to the end user? Um, and certainly, any time an app does collect personal and certainly share personal information from an end user, you should really think about getting consent from the user uh, beforehand. And uh, certainly, an additional considerations are absolutely going to apply when, you, when an app collects any type of financial, personal, or health data, and anything that's targeted towards children. 
And certainly any time this data is, is distributed to third parties, since there's a number of specific laws that do govern the use of information. For example, if an app is a game targeted towards children 13 or under, uh, the app will have to comply with the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, and a number of states also have their own regulations and laws regarding privacy and data collections. You certainly want to make sure that that privacy policy, you can find it in the EULA, it's in the application, you want to make sure someone can go to it and to review it. And again, you want to make sure that it complies with all potential uses of the application. Um, go through this really quickly to make sure we have a few more minutes here. But potential related agreements. As we talked about, there's lots of third parties that get involved with potential related, you know, with, uh, with the application. And you want to think about um, whether those third parties, again, we talked about Facebook, we talked about Twitter, we talk, there's a lot of, there's, there's a number of check-in applications. There's ones that use the gyroscope, the camera, ones that uh, interact with, that use other services that provide, whether it's for tickets or distribution. And you want to think about how all these things interact with your application, how you may distribute your application. Um, you talk about there's actually specific agreements that you, when you're talking about distributing via a carrier versus a application store. So some applications can be preloaded on devices and how that may differ. Sometimes you, your application can actually go through a reseller or a third party who's going to submit it to the application store. Or certainly, on again, on the Android side, there's a number of ways to distribute outside of the stores. And you have to think about if your application is going to have uh, payment mechanisms internally, you're going to need an, an agreement with a, trans with a merchant bank or a transaction processor in order to process your credit cards. And I, th and I think I'm going to turn it over at this point to Mike to finish up the, uh, uh, the presentation. Well, I think we just have a moment or two left. If there are questions, we'd be happy to ask them. Uh, there was a question about using HTML5 to uh, build applications, but Aaron, you touched on that with um, your discussion of web-based or even um, uh, sort of um, a modification of the two potentially locally installed and web-based. So I, I think that's been covered. And let's see if there are any other questions. Well, there, there's a question about um, if, in fact, you, you encounter terms at an app store, how to approach the app store if you want to try and resolve problematic terms, the, the answer is that it is frequently impossible to do so. Um, in general, even for very large potential providers of apps on uh, the app stores, their response is, it is what it is. If you want to have an app on our store, these are the terms under which we provide it. And uh, there, there isn't a whole lot of motivation on the other, for them to change it. On the other hand, you are in the same boat as ev absolutely everyone else making their apps available through that app store. Aaron, any thoughts on that? No, I mean, I think the, um, we've had the, we, we've had in one occasion, I think Mike has had this as well, maybe on one or two occasions, where uh, a large client did have a concern with something. We actually were able to get someone from Apple to discuss it, but that was the extent of it, and it was Apple discussing the extent of uh, what their provision means, why it's there, um, how you're going to comply with it, but they were not, they're not willing to change it. And I, I don't think... Um, I think that's really the extent of what you're going to have. And as Mike said, what comes down to everybody else, and I think in a risk assessment, is everybody else is in the exact same boat. Uh, so if there's going to be a problem for one, there's going to be a problem for everyone. And certainly someone like Apple is going to do a better job and has shown in the marketplace on occasion that they actually do try and protect their developers uh, because that's their business model in that particular case. And if everyone goes under, it's not going to be good business for them. I think with that, Jennifer, we probably turn it back to you to close this up. She might have that. Uh, oh, yes, are. thank you so much for participating in the uh, web conference today. If you have a few seconds, if you can please take a few moments to fill out our web conference survey by, cl by clicking on the link provided below, that would be great. And uh, thank you so much, Ian, for joining us today. And we hope we, we answered some of your questions. Thank you. And again, ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude today's call.